taking a driving course at a training center is Princess Elizabeth, second subaltern ATS. She has been learning to drive and maintain all types of motor vehicles. I am absolutely delighted to stand here today and say welcome to all of you for the celebration of the 80th anniversary of the formation of the Auxiliary Territorial Service through the rededication of the ATS Memorial Statue. Today we have with us the Deputy Lord Lieutenant of Staffordshire, so welcome, Dame Kelly Holmes, MBE, Life Member of the WRC Association, so welcome. I think it's only when you hear the history of it that you realise how instrumental women were um, to the success behind the guys. And I think the history has to come out more and more now to save that from being lost. When I was 14, we had the careers officers come round to our school, the Army, Air Force and Navy. Couldn't swim when I was 14, so the Navy went out the window, didn't like the ships at sea. I wasn't academic at school whatsoever and unfortunately they didn't show the flying of the planes so I didn't take that up. And then I saw the army soldiers screaming and shouting and all the others going underneath the scramble net over the 12 foot wall, you know, swinging off the ropes. I was like, yes, that's what I want to be, the physical training instructor. I wanted to be the one screaming and shouting and the one getting down dirty. I joined the army purely to hope to serve my country and I completed 23 years and if I could get a new body I'd sign on again and I joined up I think it was January 55 and um, I did one year more or less as a bat woman and I thought I wanted to think about being in the military police which I applied and went on a course and I completed 23 years. For me it was something that I've been interested in ever since I was really young. I actually was brought up just outside Harrogate and we used to see all the, yes. the young junior soldiers course, tamming yeah, through the village yes. and um, maybe a little bit mad, but I thought that looks, that looks like that fun, looks, fun. <laughs> looks like a challenge. Um, and then went on a um, battlefield tour of the Somme when I was about 15 with school and I just, the incredible respect and pride that I felt on that sort of visit and learning about the history of it all, I thought mm. that's something absolutely incredible to do as a career. We are so fortunate today to have with us during this ceremony, we have 14 ladies who served in the Auxiliary Territorial Service. To have so many of you here today is an absolute privilege and honour. Thank you. The Auxiliary Territorial Service was formed on the 9th of September 1938 and by 1949, over 350,000 women had served in over 100 roles and had been deployed to over 20 locations all over the world. You answered your country's call, you broke the doors down, and we were able to follow you into the British Army. Today we remember everything that the Auxiliary Territorial Service stood for. Their courage, their loyalty, and their comradeship we within the WRIC Association will always remember your service and your achievements. Through this act of rededication today, we salute you and thank you for laying the professional path for us to follow. The whole country was obviously very concerned about the situation and an awful lot of us felt that we should join one of the services to do our bit towards the war effort. I was actually at a domestic science college in Shrewsbury and uh, three or four of us decided that we couldn't be bothered with uh, making sausage rolls, that we would join up, uh, which we did as soon as there were vacancies. And I joined the ATS in, uh, I think it was sort of September time, 1941. Having had basic training in you know, how to march, how to wear your uniform and how to behave generally in the military, um, then it was a question of what particular trade you would like to go into and uh, being me I, I said I really didn't know. Anyway uh, my CV included a note that I'm bilingual and uh, so I think that's why I was given an interview in London by an intelligence corps officer 
And at the end of it, after about half an hour, I suppose it was, he said, here's a railway warrant, get yourself to Bletchley. Well, I'd never heard of Bletchley, and I certainly didn't know what went on there. But that's, I think, how I came to be enlisted into the team at Bletchley Park. Developing leadership by enhancing character, intellect, and professional competence. For 48 weeks, male and female officer cadets from all walks of life, British and overseas, come to be challenged, moulded, and refined. This is Sandhurst. Sandhurst isn't easy, it's not meant to be easy. And training at the Army Training Regiments for Soldiers, it's not meant to be easy. It's physically and mentally demanding. And the fact they still have that enthusiasm to go out and serve in the British Army, and the fact that they are just ripe for the challenge. All the stuff that women have gone through in the Army over the last 100 years, we're at a point where young women are actually really positive and keen to serve in the British Army. This is 101 years old. In my hand, okay, I have the very cat badge that this lady wore, and these are her discharge papers from the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, dated 1917. Wow. And, and that's a piece of history. And that was the first year that women ever, ever joined the British Army in any official capacity. And um, quite a lot of them were killed. But this gave me the shivers when I first opened it, because you know, this has actually been touched and handled and written about this, this lady who was doing something that society basically said was wrong. You know, women did not do this back in those days. Um, and it's really where the story starts, and that's what I like about it. It's, it's where the story starts. This could be me all those years ago. You know. it's, quite, um, it's quite scary because this is before the boat, isn't it? Yes, yeah, so totally. Literally, every, every woman was a man's property. Exactly. Yes. So, yes. so imagine what her father, I mean, her father's yeah. details are on there. This, this lady going off on the train that she's going to serve her country. Women don't do that. It's, it's just not, not the done thing. So to me, this, this, this lady here, she broke the norm. She turned around and said, why not? Why can't I do this? That's the first door that was kicked down. It's about keeping these doors open. Yeah. That, you know, women came back, men came back from war, suddenly is, we don't need you anymore. So the ladies that were in the ammunition factories, they were the drivers and they were going, well, hang on a minute. I've just driven a truck through, you know, to, to bring the boys back from Dunkirk with shells around me and, and you know, or, or in World War Two when this was taking place, they, they faced the same problem. It was World War One when they were coming back from France, it was, okay, off you go, home needs cleaning. And it's these doors that, that once they open, you've got to jam them open and you've got to then start unscrewing the hinges. Girls, this is urgent. Here's a real chance to help the fighting men finish off the enemy. If you're over 17 and a half and under 19, you can volunteer for the ATS. We want more girls to drive cars and ambulances. To convoy lorries to the ports. We need more girls to be cooks and clerks, to run the stores and army post offices. More girls to train as signalers and as dispatch riders to send and carry vital messages. There are plenty of interesting jobs. The instruction and training are not only interesting, but will be useful to you in civilian life. So I went to Lincoln and uh, had me medical and joined up, but my parents didn't want me to because my dad said, you're not joining up, you're not going, because in a few months' time you'll be home, bringing trouble home. But I never did. <laughs> this statue of this lovely ATS girl means such a lot to me, because it brings back such a lot of happy memories. And uh, it's wonderful that we've got a statue of the ATS girl. I call them girls now because everybody's younger than me. <laughs> in 1949, it was decided to disband the Auxiliary Territorial Service and form the Women's Royal Army Corps, which effectively was a, um, an opportunity for more women to serve on a career basis. This is, the, this is the difference. It wasn't seen as women just joining for a couple of years yeah. in response to their country's call. It was a career, and it was suddenly a career path for women to join. Um, and in 1949, um, a lot of women joined and the Women's Royal Army Corps existed until 1992. 
I was a bit of a tomboy. Um, I come from a, a family of girls and my father was a government scientist and he was responsible for designing the night vision equipment in Challenger tanks. So I spent a lot of time watching armoured vehicles with my father. Um, my sisters weren't interested so he took me with him and I spent most weekends at Bobbington watching these things racing about. I knew that I wanted something with a, a challenge um, and I settled on the army. I joined at a time where the military and women were changing. We were on the cusp of, we of what women mm. could and couldn't do. Mm. Um, society was changing completely. Between us, we've been all over the all world. Over the world yeah. And it was a time of conflict, which isn't a great thing, um, but conflict means the British Army deploys. And uh, both yeah. of us have been on many deployments between us. And that's where you do your trade. That's what we're trained to do. I was in the first female platoon to ever enter Sandhurst. And that was a huge culture change. This place had been male only for 300 years. Mm. And to have women suddenly come here was, everybody had to change the way they looked at things. Do we know what the men's like, reaction to having the women in the army was? Well, in 1917, yeah. utterly yeah. horrified. Mm. Not just horrified, but they thought it was a complete abomination. Mm. And abomination is the word that's often used. Mm. How could women who were life givers and supposed to um, be in the home, um, how, could that, how could they possibly mm. you know, do this? But funnily enough, those were the same arguments that were being used when I joined the army. Exactly the same arguments. Mm. How could women do these roles? I joined in 1984 and I was the first ever female platoon to come into this academy. So as you can imagine, we've got 300 years of tradition suddenly being swept aside. And Cathy is of the same era mm. as I am, so she very much remembers those, those same kind of attitudes. And if you look just over there, there's a, um, a poster, a recruiting poster that was used in the 1980s. And at first look, um, um, what's your first impressions when you look at that? Without thinking too deeply about it. Yeah. Yeah. Clean <laughs> yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Typical sexist um, stuff that I'm sure all of you have heard and aware of. But actually, if you think about it, the irony is quite interesting. And whoever thought that up was actually quite clever, because, of course, that's exactly what the blokes do too. You know, they, they live in the field and do exactly the same jobs as you do. So I think for, uh, that was the recruiting poster that, that I was recruited under. Um, to come here. But you were asking about a story about how the ATS or the WAAC were, were treated. The boys would deliberately sabotage the vehicles, mm. let the tiles down because if a woman couldn't change a tyre, well she was no good, we could send her home to do the dishes. A car's not much use unless the wheels go round. No, she's not stamping with rage, she's learning how to put on a tyre cover. A hefty job even for a hefty girl. All set now for a driving test. Mm. They would deliberately cut the fuel lines to see a female struggle. Is that because they felt threatened? Yes, or, yeah, just, mm. because the status quo. It was, like Ali was saying, that the tradition, hundreds of years of tradition, where, you know, suddenly, who are we to come in and say, well, I can do that. When I joined the army in 1965, I think because we were a women-only corps, we accepted what we were allowed to do more than in later years when women's emancipation became more so and, and women wanted to do more, didn't they? I mean, for us to go rifle shooting uh, with, with the guys was, was a one-off occasion, which, which we all enjoyed, but, you know, we didn't expect to do that as a regular thing, not in the 60s, 70s. You know, that came later. Definitely women have more scope, I think, in all fields now, not only in the armed forces. I didn't even know that there was women in the army and we had a recruiting team came to our school in Gloucestershire and they set up an assault course for the boys. I was a bit of a tomboy at the time, I was into sports so of course me being me I decided I was going to have a go and the boys weren't going to have all the fun. So after I'd finished and I quite impressed the uh, recruiting sergeant and he spoke to me about the women's army. I was 15 at the time so obviously I was too young to join but it was there in my mind, the back of my mind, that as soon as I was 17, that's what I wanted to do. And when I joined, the proudest day of my life, and it still is today, is when I took the Queen's oath and swore allegiance to the Queen. I was just so proud that day. Lord, we thank you for all those, and there were so very many as you've just heard, 
who volunteered or were conscripted during the war years, and those who served on until the formation of the WRC in 1949. We thank you for their courage, steadiness, their pioneering spirit and willingness to do new jobs in dangerous places and the verve that was brought to their situations. Father, we thank you for them and celebrate their service in your son's name. Amen. And two, let us remember those members of the ATS who died in the struggle for freedom in World War II, those of their predecessors and successors who also have given their lives. <laughs> Right at, almost at the end, next few weeks to do, and then you pass up those days. Do you think you're equal to your male counterparts? Mm. We're definitely treated the same, I think, but there's still some aspects, maybe more physical, that are okay. definitely uh, well, still more challenging. It's about proving yourself and giving you the opportunity to say, yes, I might not be able to run at the PFA as fast as you can, I might not be able to get over the wall without a little bit of a boost up, but it's the other aspects, I think everyone would agree, that, that you add value in other ways, and strengths and weaknesses lie in males and females in different places okay. and not even just down to males and females down to an individual and mm -hmm. i think we'd all agree that now especially coming to the end of the training we've created a firm kind of grounding mm -hmm. of where our strengths and weaknesses lie and been able to work as a cohort yeah. rather than as the three females in the platoon and the 27 males mm -hmm. yeah. what about your male counterparts your colleagues because of course again when when i went through basic training when kathy went through we didn't mix with men, it was, just, it was just all female. So what about your male colleagues? It varies in um, acknowledgement from person to person, mm -hmm. how much, I suppose, some of the very alpha male infantier kind of guys, it was if, they actually, it was if they actually appreciate the sort of softer skills that potentially some of the females can offer more of that they actually can't. So I think that's, you know, that's something that still is, is evident at times, yeah. not with everybody, but, yeah. I would add, but with add some. On to that, that was definitely the case at the start, but come now, mm. so now, where we're nearly finished now. Because you've, you've had the opportunity to prove yourself. Yeah. Yeah. They had these parachutes now where you come in for standing jumps now, but I've got two titanium knees now and two plates <laughs> in my right hip. So anyway, was it a year ago, they said, oh, Benlo, they said, there's a tandem jump coming up. I thought, oh, strapped to a man, I'll have a go. <laughs> and when I hit the deck, the papa went, oh, miss, great. What was it like? Oh, I said, great. I just hope I didn't squash his willy. <laughs> well, it was on TV and they said, cat. <laughs> yeah, because the jump master said, come on, Bimmo, hit your bum <laughs> into me. <laughs> I think the Women's Royal Armour Corps Association is absolutely crucial if the role of women and their journey within the British Army is to be told. Because we're the only charity, the only organisation that wants to do it. Um, we're the only female specific charity representing women who've served in the British Army. There's nobody else. We are firmly focused on telling that story and also supporting women who've served. You know, we distribute benevolence grants to people who are finding life financially hard. We support the ladies who served in the ATS, some of whom are just living on their old age pension. So there's a real need for us to support them. I hope that we can make um, changes in our membership, grow our membership, but also make our membership more diverse. When you walk into a room and you don't know anybody, and any normal event, you're walking into that room alone, you go to an association event mm. and you've suddenly got 200 friends. Mm. And it is, it's coming home, I think. It's like a family and um, 
this is even when you leave it, it's, it doesn't leave you, it's still there with you as well. And this is a good reason um, for having the Women's Royal Army Corps Association. It's like coming home again, don't yeah. you agree, Bimbo? Yeah. It is, yeah. We're a big family. It's one, just one family, it doesn't matter mm. where you live, you're, you're just part of a big family. I think it's wonderful that we're incorporated in this amazing place at Aravos. It's, it's very important historically and something to be very proud of. I was commanding a tank and, you know, that's not what's normal to most people's lives, but I do think it's important that people can see the history and actually what's happening in real life now. You know, women are capable of doing whatever they want to do. And I think being given the opportunities and the doors open to them, I think that's been very special. So I definitely urge people to go on the WROC website or the Facebook group to find out what is accessible to them. It's also a great community. You know, I've come here today uh, meeting so many women and I brought a friend along with me who's never served and I did say to her it's a completely different language when you get back to the military. I've met people here that I served with, people here that were my bosses, uh, but we're all equal because we know what it was like to be part of something very special. So um, I would definitely urge those that are either serving or have served to get back in touch with the Women's Royal Army Corps Association and you never know where you might end up.